In freezing weather, the men dug trenches, bringing them closer to the walls. Siege warfare of this era was not unlike the battlefields of the First World War. The soldiers were forced to dig trenches under heavy artillery and musket fire. It was terrifying and back-breaking work, very unpopular with the troops, who much preferred a stand-up fight in an open field. Captain William Gratton, of the 88th Regiment of Foot, the Connaught Rangers and a regular on this programme, recalled, Every exertion was made to forward the works, so fully were all impressed with its necessity. But notwithstanding the animated exertions of the engineers and the ready cooperation of the infantry, their progress was at times unavoidably slower than was anticipated. In some instances the soil was unfavourable. It was next to an impossibility to make head against it. Instead of clay or gravel we frequently met with a vein of rock, and invariably when this occurred our losses were severe. For the pickaxes coming into contact with the stone caused a fire, he means a spark, to issue that plainly told the enemy where we were. And as a matter of course, they redoubled their efforts on these points. End quote. He was Irish, but I'm not doing an accent. The much improved British artillery, which were now all modern iron guns, began to chip away at the city's walls. And by the 19th of January, there were two breaches big enough to be attacked. Crawford's Light Division and Picton's 3rd Division, both elite units, were tasked with the final assault. George Simmons was an officer of the 95th, part of the Light Division, the Rifles, and he wrote in his diary, The 3rd Division moved to attack the right breach and the Light Division the left, or smaller breach. The forlorn hope and storming parties moved on at about 7 o'clock in the evening, and the head of the column followed close behind. A tremendous fire was opened upon us, and as our column was entering the ditch, a magazine on the ramparts by the large breach blew up and ignited a number of live shells, which also exploded and paid no sort of difference to friend or foe. The night was brilliantly illuminated for some moments, and everything was made visible. Then, as suddenly came utter darkness, except for the flashes from the cannon and muskets, which threw a momentary glare around us. End quote. The third division, caught by the massive explosion at the large breach, suffered dreadfully and were stunned, their attack temporarily grinding to a halt. The light division, meanwhile, had managed to force the smaller breach, but not without their own tragedy. For their commander, Major General Robert Black Bob Crawford, was shot directing the attack. A musket ball shattered his ribs before passing through his lung and lodging in his spine. He died of his injuries four days later. I guess some of the troops would have had very mixed feelings about the death of General Crawford or Crawford. He was a very strict disciplinarian. Doesn't come across that favourably, I don't think, reading back. But he was a very solid general. Wellington trusted him a lot. And the men trusted him that despite his harsh attitude towards them, he did get the job done. The French, pushed back from the breaches, were soon forced to surrender. But the British soldiers then decided to sack the town and a brutal night of drunken disorder followed. Captain Jonathan Leach, another officer with the 95th Rifles, they really liked writing biographies, said, When the town is stormed, it is inevitable that excesses will be, as ever have been, committed by the assailants more particularly if it takes place at night. It affords a favourable opportunity for the loose and dissolute characters which are to be found in all armies to indulge in every diabolical propensity. This was a case to a certain extent on the night in question. No one will deny. But at the same time, I feel convinced that no town ever taken by assault, ever did or ever will, suffer less than Rodrigo. It is true that soldiers of all regiments got drunk, plundered and made great noise and confusion in the streets and houses, in spite of every exertion on the part of the officers to prevent it. But bad and revolting as such scenes are, I never heard that either the French garrison, when it had once surrendered, nor any inhabitants, suffered personal indignities or cruelty from the troops. Now, I don't know if that's 100% true or not, but he was there. This night of drunken over-exuberance and collapsing discipline was a worrying taste of what was to come following the capture of Badajoz. We'll get to that. 
The capture of Theodad or Ciudad Rodrigo had been an excellent example of what could be achieved by Wellington and his men when they had the correct artillery and engineering support. It was carried out with a degree of professionalism and speed previously unknown in the Peninsular Army. But that army must now turn its attention to another walled city, this one much stronger and more complicated to assault. It was time to return to Badajoz and secure the Spanish-Portuguese border once and for all. 